So you're saying this is the unsung hero of postal history? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, you know, stamps obviously hugely important in the introduction of the penny post. The Mulready, without the Mulready, without this having been produced, we would have just had a, a, a blank sheet of paper. And then who knows if we would have even had a Christmas card. But without things like that, without the caricatures being made, it led to a whole wealth of things. Not just your Christmas cards, you can imagine postcards, you can imagine first day covers. Because prior to 1840, prior to this envelope being produced, there was nothing. It was a blank sheet of paper, and you just wrote your letter on that, took it to the post office, paid a sum of money, off it went. Absolutely nothing, virtually nothing exists prior to 1840 with printed designs on it. And I think, again, this is definitely got to be the thing that kick-started it. Hi, I'm uh, Robin Cassell. Uh, I'm the owner of Mulready Philatelics. Uh, we're currently at Stampex on Stand 74. Uh, we've been dealing in uh, classic Great Britain and world stamps for about 15 years. And we have a particular passion for all things more ready here. So I started out as a collector. I started collecting when I was uh, about 15 years old. Um, my dad bought a small collection and uh, got me interested. And I think uh, like a, a lot of people, then you, you uh, get a job, you go to work. And after a few years, you're looking for something that uh, might take your mind off things. And so I went back into stamps. And uh, I found myself uh, collecting stamps uh, for about 10 years, penny blacks, that sort of stuff. And then I saw my first Mulready caricature and I got hooked. And uh, started collecting Mulready's, Mulready caricatures, realized that this was something I could turn into a business. And um, we did that about 15 years ago and never looked back. Robin, I guess the big question is, what is a Mulready? What is a Mulready? Okay, so this is a Mulready. Now the Mulready came in two values, a penny value and a tuppenny value. And the idea was it was brought out at the same time as, as the penny black and the tuppenny blue, uh, 6th of May 1840. And the government thought if they sold these as well, people could just buy the whole envelope or the whole wrapper, write their message on it, post it, no need to put a stamp on it. Uh, so they wouldn't need to find an envelope or some letter paper or whatever. And basically it was a very sound idea because we still use similar things today. You can still buy printed postal stationery today. Um, so the penny value is in black. Uh, the tuppenny value is in blue. And they were cancelled with a Maltese cross. So William Mulready's idea was to show post effectively being sent out right around the world. So in the centre of it, we have an image of Britannia, and she's seated on a lion, and then you can see she's throwing out messages around the world, and they're supposedly delivering letters to all the corners of the planet. You've got people in Asia, in Europe, in the Far East, you've got images of elephants, you've got camels, and uh, there are people opening letters um, from all parts of the world. So. In essence, not a bad idea. It's trying to explain what everyone's wanting to do. What they realised very shortly um, was that actually the Victorian public did not like this design. They thought it was actually well over the top. It was designed by a guy called William Mulready. He was a Royal Academy artist. And uh, the very week that the Mulready came out, he was displaying three of his paintings at the Royal Academy. And then Within that week, he found out, to his mortification, if you like, that the public thought his new design was a ludicrous design. Roland Hill, who's the founder of the Penny Post, realized the error of their ways, and they thought we're going to have to come up with something a lot simpler. So they came up with something called Penny Pink. But it was about nine months to a year before they managed to do all the necessary stuff to bring this out. So meanwhile, what happened? is that the most famous caricaturists and the print sellers of the day in London and in Edinburgh started to come out with caricatures, pictorial designs that took the mickey out of the establishment, the government, anybody they could think of, especially the clergy. 
and so you ended up with all the characters being replaced by other things. So sometimes instead of a lion, there might be a pig. And this is one of the most famous of those. This is the first English design by a guy called John Leach. He was a famous artist, did a lot of work for Dickens. And within about three weeks, he had come up with this design and it was already available in the shop. So we're in May 1840, the Moridi is being sold. They printed millions of them. These caricatures come out and these are the hit. You know, people see these and then all sorts of other people get to work producing these caricatures, all sorts of designs going on. And there's nothing the government can do about it. So it's kind of like the Sky News of the day. You know, you would see prints of these things in the windows of the shop going down the Strand. And um, people would see these prints and, and, you know, tell their friends. And the whole thing spread across the country. Um, and so what you would then do is you would then send one to one of your friends. Now, this is a used caricature, a used horse caricature. Now, if we go back to the, the Penny Moridi here, roughly speaking, you can find a nice unused Penny Moridi around about 50 to 100 pounds. Uh, a nice used one will probably cost you 150 to 200 pounds. Some of the caricatures are extremely rare. This design by Fours in unused condition, probably about 250, 350 pounds. But a used one with a Penny Black on it, may cost you five thousand pounds may cost you ten thousand pounds but back in the day the victorian collectors were much more interested in the stamps than they were in the covers themselves so what you tended to find was often during the sort of victorian period the collector often the, the husband of the family would take the stamp off but rather than throwing the cover away often the wife would then cut the back off of it and stick it in an album. And many of these have survived purely because of that. And then what has happened over the years is that as these have increased in value, people have then, as has happened here, stuck a stamp back on it. So what you've got is effectively a cover that doesn't have its original stamp and the back has been removed. So it's still an original 1840 used caricature. This is the most common design that was produced. There are about 80 of these in the world now and used. And most of those are used in this year, 1840. Because as soon as this comes along, then the humour's gone. So everybody is now thinking, well, there's no point producing these. We can't be taking the mickey out of those. So it stops. So there's about 80 used ones of these in the world. Because of the faults that this has, though, it's a front without his original stamp. You can buy an original used caricature by John Leach here for about 500 pounds. So it means that, you know, the market is, you know, there are affordable things for collectors of all pockets, if you like, to delve into. Has anybody gone ahead and tried to catalogue them all? And if so, do you know how many they possibly are out there? Of the caricatures? Yes. Scotty, Funny you should say that, <laughs> Yes. No, we've just, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Richard Hobbs, we're just in the process of uh, finishing book. Um, it's about 850 pages and we put in the book every single used caricature that we've been able to find and we searched all of the records and all of the libraries, auctions, houses and so on over the last hundred years. And there probably are about 1,500 used caricatures in the world. 1,500? 1,500 used ones. Uh, and as I say, many of them are known only by one design, one copy. Many of them are unique. But the more popular ones, like the false comic number one we've been talking about, yeah. say 80 used ones. Uh, some of the ones by Hume, there are 25, 30 of. He produced many designs. Um, this one here is an incredible item. So this is, we're still in 1840. This is a, a guy called Dickie Doyle. He's 15 years old. Within a year, he's doing the front page of Punch. Um, he's a famous artist from the time, he did a lot of work for Dickens and he produced this envelope as part of a series of ten that he did by Fours. Fours were a stationers in the Strand 
They were the biggest stationers in the country. So everybody went to Fours to see their prints, their satirical uh, prints and so on. And this is the first time that anything with a Christmas design appears in print. There are no postcards, Christmas cards at this time. They didn't come for another two or three years. So here, Britannia has been replaced uh, by a guy, as you can see, cutting an enormous Christmas pudding. And uh, these would have been very popular at the time, but this came towards the end of the collecting and the printing of these caricatures because the Maori was being replaced. So actually, these are extremely rare. So you can find unused ones like this. Again, the price is 250 to 400 pounds. They come beautifully hand-coloured sometimes. There are later reproductions done by a Belgian dealer called Moens in the 1890s. Those can be found for 40 or 50 pounds. Um, but this one used is about three known in the world. And uh, Wow, just three? Just three in the world, yeah. Um, and so they're an extremely rare item. You would have thought they were more popular. It's interesting because this, like you said, predates the famous first Christmas card, right? You'd think that this should get a little more recognition for that, right? You absolutely should. Um, so the guy that, that, that invented the first Christmas card was a guy called uh, Halsey. And he actually worked uh, with Roland Hill on the Penny Post. So he was familiar with the whole setup. He may have even been inspired by something like this. So his oh, first wow. Christmas cards, which come out 1842, 43, there are about 15 in the world. They change hands for maybe £10,000 on a good day for a nice one. Uh, a few years ago, a well-known auction house actually had three examples for sale. And um, they had one of them in combination with this envelope. Ah. And their suggestion was this envelope was made for that Christmas card yeah. to go in. But actually, this came three years before the first ever Christmas card. So yes, it should be a much more well-known, famous thing that it is. Yeah, so Mulready's, as I say, are available from a, a, a variety of places. We have an online store, um, and there are still shops in London and around the country. Um, but I would recommend that, um, yeah, I, I just just check out online. If you go on somewhere like even eBay, for example, they will find many Mulready's on there. It'll give you a flavour for what's available. Um, there are later copies. So that can be a good thing and a bad thing. You've got to watch out for reprints, things that uh, glisten are not always gold. So, you know, an original Maori might cost you 50 to 100 pounds unused. There have been reprints right up to the present day. People will be making reprints of them already. That might be worth a pound, you know. So if you're seriously interested in them, check them out first before we're parting with your money. And of course, we're always very happy to help. So we are on eBay. Uh, we're called Penny Black One and we are already with Philatelics. And uh, our website, we're just in the process of uh, revamping that. That'll be a new website, moreadyphilatelics.co.uk. It is uh, an auction site. We'll be selling plenty of Mulready's on there as well. Terrific, well this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for this discussion. Thank you for sharing all this knowledge. And I look forward to seeing you doing the rest of Stampix. Pleasure, Graham. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Thank you. This video was made in partnership with the Philatelic Traders Society, the PTS, a society protecting the philatelic trade since 1929, in which its reputation for honesty, integrity, and professionalism spans the globe. Collectors purchasing from dealers must look for the PTS shield to make sure their purchases come from a reputable PTS dealer. To learn more and look through the dealer directory, or even apply to have your stamp store join the PTS, go to the PTS. Net. More videos to come, so stay tuned. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.